So my name's Dave Linton and I'm the founder and CEO of Mad Lug, which stands for Make a Difference Luggage. We sell bags. Every time we sell a bag, we give a bag to an incredible child in care for free. It kind of goes back to when I was, was five and my dad died. Youth workers and leaders were really important in my life. There's less foster cares and particularly since COVID, there's a greater demand. It's in crisis. Don't see what you start today, particularly as a young person as the thing that you're going to finish at. It was a young girl, teenager in a wheelchair, and she made this statement. When we move, the trusts or local authorities don't give us suitcases. Sometimes foster carers loan us a suitcase, but quite often our belongings are moved in black plastic bin bags and lose their dignity. And I remember that night going, that's wrong. I'm going to fix it. How's it going, people? Welcome back to another episode of the Here's the Crack podcast, another guest episode, and this week we have... Dave Linton from Madlog. Yes. How's it going? It's going well, thanks. Awesome. Correct. You've listened to a few podcasts before of ours, so you know roughly the crack anyway. You know what you're getting yourself into. Absolutely. I'm a little <laughs> bit nervous. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no need to be nervous. Um, well, I'm going to put you on the spot, actually. So before we... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Why did I say that? Yeah. <laughs> so you do have a good right to be nervous. So before we begin the podcast, I think, um, without getting into too much detail, picture you're on an elevator with one of us or someone else, and they ask you who you are and what you do. You sort of have that 30 seconds of the escalator ride or the elevator ride. What would your response be? Yeah, so 90,000 children in care. Um, in the UK, one child moving every 15 minutes and most have their belongings in bin bags. So my name's Dave Linton and I'm the founder and CEO of Mad Lug, which stands for Make a Difference Luggage. Basically, we give a bag. We sell bags. Every time we sell a bag, we give a bag to an incredible child in care for free. I got was the best. D- yeah, that's yeah. the best. <laughs> straight, or, straight on that one. Were you oh, practicing it. the mirror last night before you came here? <laughs> <laughs> he was listening. I only know so how to say that. That's it. So <laughs> podcast over. That's it. <laughs> I think that's us. Uh, you've told us <laughs> what we need to know, but um, I think yeah, as as you said, obviously you're you're founder of Mad Lug and make a difference luggage. Um, before we get into like the business um, of Mad Lug, I think it's strip it back and go from kind of the beginning. So before you get into this business, you were a youth worker for a very long time. How long? Yeah, so I spent um, busy from I was eighteen. So before that, I was just talking to Shay earlier about that I actually started my working career at sixteen and went and trained as, started training as an architectural technician. There you go. And then a recession hit, and the um, company let us all go, and I had six months from finishing my studies and felt, I don't really want to do that any longer, yeah. and I ended up in youth work. So at 18, I was in youth work until I was 42. Whew. That's a long time. Absolutely. And um, so what, what, what did that role entail, like whenever you hear youth worker, like what, what was it you, was it you actually did for them? Yes, so there. so my youth work started off in the in North Belfast, just in the shangle, just um, in the midst of the troubles. So that was a uh, um, for me. Uh, I worked for a little church. It was six or seven office. It was like a tenor on your duel kind of thing. That was how I got started. You know, I was unemployed and took a tenor and thought, well, I'll just get into youth work. And um, and so I spent two years doing that with a group um, there, five or six of us, and um, just got to know those local communities and. And just um, got to enjoy working and playing table tennis, pool, and just getting alongside um, young people. Has that always been sort of like a, a, a sort of, I would say, an interest of yours in terms of wanting to like give back to young people or help out where you can? Yeah, I, I think for me, I think for me, Ross, is that the, the simplicity was so. A, it kind of goes back to when I was, was five and my dad died, mm-hmm. heart attack, my mum kind of brought us up in a single home and so youth work and kind of youth workers and leaders in kind of things like BB and stuff like that were, were really kind of um, kind of important in my life and then I kind of grew this thing where because of the kind of my own story it's always given me this DNA to help the most vulnerable yeah. um, the most challenging the underdogs in society because yeah. in many ways I was I was kind of there a little bit from from childhood so that's been a probably my drive then and still my drive actually today yeah nice and in terms of obviously going through that time when you lost your dad and stuff like um did you obviously your mum was still around but at the same time did you have anybody that kind of almost like stepped up into that because that's quite a young age and that's almost like seeking that sort of father role after your dad's passed away was there anybody that you can sort of like relate back to that maybe was the 
sort of crux of you getting into that and thinking i want to be like that whenever i'm older i want to have that same impact yeah there, w- there wasn't anybody particularly that was a youth worker but there was there was um i i talk about significant adults in my life so yeah. so if it hadn't been for those significant adults i probably lived on the edge of care we had social workers involved um you know just because in those days there was resource of social workers for kids that were yeah. in widowed homes but um there was definitely families who lived next door to us within our community that they were they became like non-blood aunt and uncles and then their kids who maybe this, their sons were maybe um you know three four five years older than me would have taken me out windsurfing doing all the things once they drove yeah. we were we were um you know supported football alongside them did all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. so so that was where and then they would have been volunteering as youth leaders in some of these organizations yeah. so so for me that was the 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 part was there any like difficulties you would have faced that you'd seen like other kids that you'd maybe grown up with and you seen them getting stuff that you weren't getting <laughs> yourself you, obviously you've said that you've done not architecture and all you've done well like you got to do something that you wanted to do to like study wise but was there any other difficulties you faced growing up yeah so f- f- growing up i hate at school mm. and um don't we and, all uh, yeah absolutely <laughs> I, 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 and actually I, 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 when i look back you know i i, I I've actually, as an adult, been diagnosed with um, dyslexia. All right. So, so for me, um, you know, growing up in school, it was that frustration as a young person, kind of like, mm. I, I know how to do this. I, I was, I'm smart, but yet my results in my in school environment left me feeling stupid. Yeah. And so there was always that grit. Um, so, so getting into architecture, like I didn't have the right qualifications even to get as an architectural technician. Yeah. I said, I'm going to be an architect. I knew very early on I wasn't going to get grades. Mm. And and then when I left school at sixteen, I started knocking doors and just I learned how to talk. Yeah. And in many ways, I talked myself into jobs that I couldn't even do. Yeah. Um. But but there was an element of just drive that if I, if I got something to do, I'm going to do it. Um. You know. So in, looking back, that's how, you know, it was kind of dyslexia at that stage. And when you're dyslexic, you find solutions. And for me, that was part of the, yeah. the, the, the journey. So, but it was definitely a challenge when I was younger. Yeah. What What did you figure out you were dyslexic? So it was really in my in my late thirties. Um, so you never knew the whole time. Well, I just I mean I always knew that like when I'm reading a book, it would take mm-hmm. me to. Um, I needed to read stuff that I was really interested to learn something. So if it was something on how to do this, and I wanted to know how to do it. I would read through that book, but it wouldn't. Yeah. Um, it would take me ages. Yeah. And um, and so then it was it was through some friends who work in this area. Then went through some processing. And then you found out. It's mad. Um, now I, I feel as dyslexia as a super weapon. I absolutely you know I tell that in schools. I, you know, and if I was in school today, I would have support around me to be able to achieve. Yeah. But in those yeah. days, you were just smart or stupid. And yeah. I kind of came under the stupid. Yeah. yeah. It's cool though, in terms of you read a lot about it now that um, you know ki- kids or or even adults and stuff like they're more who have the likes of dyslexia or even other things like ADHD or something that it's almost like they see it as this big sort of like oh that must mean that they they can't do things that other people can do. But when you actually really look into it, they are probably the most creative and like forward thinking people because they they can take what is normal to everyone else and like almost bend it and warp it to suit them which almost stems in like a, another creative thinking behind everything uh, to- yeah. to- totally i mean i i think back to one of the things i got in trouble for in school was it was in p7 and um you know the 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 cl- teacher and that there was a really good teacher and i was doing well but but still not really performing in results and, and that kind of stuff no chance of getting an 11 plus at the time and um but there was this kind of like library yeah. Mm-hmm. And the, the library was, um, you know, there was like competition. So whoever read the most books got some prizes. And, um, and I couldn't read very well or, far, or fast if I, if I could read at all. And um, so I went over and um, I would have taken the books that I knew that there was. Now, these were the days there was like VHS video tapes, you know, yeah. and this, in the shops that sold the VHS or you rented out. So I took the book that I knew that there was some sort of film made. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> and I, I went and hired the video. <laughs> I watched the video and, and then came back and quickly filled in the book review. Yeah. So I was miles ahead of anybody else in my class. Yeah. 
and um, until my best mate he squealed on me and I was like <laughs> I into, what a title I, I got into trouble like but now looking back I'm thinking that was so great yeah. problem solution, solution. Yeah. here let's yeah. fix it so you read the most books without even reading a book yeah <laughs> so, like, just hoping that all Brilliant. the forms are made correctly <laughs> <laughs> um you've I've sort of watched we've watched a couple of interviews that you, and stuff that you've done before and read a couple of you know articles that you've done with um different people and um sort of alluding to that you are you you have experience in the foster care system in terms of you were as a respite foster care yeah and you're also uh, an adoptive parent as well absolutely yeah so like i think explain to us because to be fair i don't think that's something that you know is talked about a lot over here like we take the kind of uk in general but i don't feel like we were ever really because it's never been something that's impacted us personally like i know at school or even growing up it's never really been something that's been talked about so like explain to us in terms of even uk or over here in general what that kind of area is like in terms of its challenges or what you kind of see yeah, so yeah, I totally agree that the perception of children, young people in care, you know, kind of has a lot of stigma around. I mean, I think even my own life going to BB on a Friday night and there was this huge big mansion of a house and it was just a home of some family. Mm -hmm. But we were brought up like driving past the car. If you don't behave, that's a children's home. Do you know, yeah. it's kind of like those are the kind of stories and it was kind of like, you know, um, this perception because there, there wasn't a lot to be told. I think for me, it was, um, you know, I, I grew up in some ways wanting to give children without parents or without the input, healthy input of a parent, what I didn't have myself growing up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I, I stood at the side of, um, you know, I watched my friends, you know, get alongside, go to football matches and you know, have their dads on the sidelines and champion them and stuff like that. And and then when you're a kid, you just realize that you think, oh, they've all together. And I, what I realize is I have a really positive res relationship and what I know my dad being and what my mom, and I never had my mom and dad falling out and all the kind of yeah. stuff, you know, and you, you, but and as a child, you're looking at it, all the things you don't have. I just wish yeah. somebody would take me and play tennis with me or take me to a football pitch and knock a ball about. And, um, you know, so so for me, it was like growing up, I just was more and more growing this desire for the total underdog to, yeah. to mm -hmm. give back. And and I saw that in youth work, you know, when I was working in Shankill to my last role, which was working just outside Lurkin. You know, I just wanted to sit along, play FIFA, do all the stuff, get alongside those who most other youth leaders and youth workers would have wanted to get rid of in their youth centers because they yeah. were causing trouble. Um, so taking that into then children in care is one of those areas and so the more I found out about it the more I thought well I want to do more about it so whenever I met my wife my wife was already as a single girl um, basically doing respite foster care mm -hmm. and then the placement had moved on and and so whenever we got married I just it was dead easy to go and do you know foster yeah. foster care and get mm -hmm. me registered and then as a as a couple we had talked very early that even with birth children we would want to adopt yeah. so it was already in our our, our kind of scenario um, and that was really it we were just kind of like rest by care F you know that th these children are you know amazing and we love having them around our house and then kind of in the last my last role there was i was given a house that to live in because they wanted me to live in this community yeah and it was bigger than I could afford. Yeah. And I had an extra room. And it was like, my wife says, you know, we could we could do some more foster. I said, that's a great idea. But because we had moved from the different trust area, we had to go right back to the start. Yeah. And it was in that moment then that, that I find started to find out a lot more about the care system. I'm sorry, just to go back on that, what is respite foster care? I, I absolutely hate the word and, and rarely use it now, but yeah. it's just that there's a mindset. So... Um, I would prefer to call it short break right. because I, I believe in every child in care being incredible and um, respite in its very name says it's it's a break from mm -hmm. so so I would prefer a short break but right, so okay. so really what it is is you have short term medium term long term um, emergency care foster care all these different that the children enter into different homes and then you have respite or short break 
Yeah. Um, and so for in our case, it was we had a young child came along um, once a month for a weekend. Right. So in some ways, it was really cool because we just went to the cinema, we went bowling, we did all the fun stuff. We were like a more aunt and uncle role than a parent role. Yeah. Um, and we did that. And actually, the young person that we had then at eight is still a huge part of our family with their own children as a single parent. Wow. So we, we just see it as it's just a, a I call it a you know, significant adult role yeah. within the, the life of a child. And like if someone listening maybe wanted to do a bit and help out, like how do you get involved with it, that sort of thing? Or that's a that's a really good question. So there's a need for I, I believe there's a role for anybody to work with children, young people in care from the place of just being a mentor and there's there's organizations out there doing mentoring where you can meet up with a young person regularly and take them through a program and get to know them and be a positive significant adult to the place if you want to do respite or short break right through to long term um, you go through the local trust or you go through a, a charity that's the likes of a Bernardo's or an action for children something yeah. like that and and it's not just for married couples it can be you say my wife did it as a as a young you know the twenties single yeah. single single person and would you say there's like a lack of people getting involved in that or is the it's in crisis serious? yeah yeah so it's a there's a there's a an aging population of foster carers who are are finishing up doing it mm. and yeah. and if you think of there was two thousand eight hundred children and young people in care in Northern Ireland when I first started, and there's now about three and a half to three thousand eight hundred. <sighs> So, you know, there's wow. less foster cares and si particularly since COVID, there's a greater demand yeah. on the system. And that's, re that's seen across the whole of the UK as well. And in terms of that, like, obviously we've talked there is two sort of, two sort of things there. There's the adoptive side and then there is the, the foster care side. So in terms of it, so for, for anybody maybe listening who isn't aware, like the foster care is, is really, you're taking kids on into your into your home for say a short period of time while they're maybe trying to find an adoptive family for for that child um would that be right or yeah, that that's that's one so it, it um you can have long-term foster placements mm. where it, it comes to a, a child a child is is um, put into taken into care mainly to protect you know it's yeah. ne never the child's fault it's adults have let them down they've come from tough um, environments often so they come in there's a protective um, reason for doing that and um, and and the whole time is how do we get them in back to back to, to family yeah. at some points the they think they look at it and go well this, this is impossible or there's just no way that we're going to be able to get the child into then in some of those cases then those children are put up for adoption and then there's a court order that they become then your children. Yeah. Um, but but you can have children that have been with one family in foster care right through to 18, 19, mm -hmm. and, and then stay with them as their children, but have yeah. they're not officially their children. I think that's cool the, the, you know, the, to there, the sort of story that you said about um, you fostered, you brought in someone and now they're like a, a part of your family and they have their own kids and stuff. I think that's that's cool. And in terms of like the adoption side of things, you you are an adoptive parent yourself, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And how how does sort of how does that sort of work in terms of going about that side of things? Because obviously, if you were look, if there is someone, I know there's there's a big talk now about like couples maybe not being able to have kids or whatever, mm -hmm. but maybe wanting kids. How would that be something that you? What would be your first port of call to kind of look into doing that? Yeah, so adoption is definitely um, yes attractive to that you know yeah. people who who are struggling um, to have children, and um, and it's one way, and it's definitely brings a lot of um, value and worth to the to the child's child's life. It isn't just easy all the time. You yeah. know, you're working with kids that um, trauma uh, children with adoption. You know, there's a there it used to be adoption was often where you know somebody got pregnant outside of marriage mm -hmm. and then they they didn't want the child to stop their career path or they were the family didn't want them to be seen with a child so instead of you know um 
you know, instead of keeping them, they basically put them out for adoption. So you would have had babies who were literally born then into the process of adoption. Now, most adoptions are because of a breakdown in a family unit. Mm -hmm. And and so they then, adoption is one of the, the roots. With that brings trauma. You've got a child in the same way as I went when I was 30 for counseling and all the trauma of being a child at five, losing my dad. And the loss of that, you have all that trauma and more yeah. in a life. So, so it's not just an ideal of let's get a nice little family. It's a yeah. different type of work, but it is really worthwhile. Yeah. Um, you know, our daughter is our daughter. Uh, we yeah. love her to bits, and um, and I wouldn't do it any other way. Do you think it is something that does deter people from adopting if they're not adopting, say, a baby or the the other thing? It, like if they're adopting it, someone that's say like two, three years old. I think there's a lot more people who ask those questions and are maybe put off or they, mm. they start the process and then when they realize, oh, you might not be, and you know, get somebody under the age of five. Yeah. Um, what what seems to be happening more, and I'm not an expert in all of this space, um, what seems to be happening is this thing called concurrent care, which is like a baby um, and they foster the child with it and then there's lots of contact where they're back with the birth families and looking at they're looking for is there a granny or is there an aunt that would take and and kinship care mm -hmm. um to them with the concurrent is the foster with a few to adopt so there's a you know so people are doing that but there's always the risk with that of you know suddenly at three the social workers could say we're we're giving you know the child's going to aunt over here or mm -hmm. yeah it's I think it is like difficult like I think Ross you sort of mentioned there like you might have a couple who can't have kids and then they decide they want to adopt like it's like how do you get to that stage where maybe a couple's considering adopting or helping out with foster care before you know not just for that reason if that makes sense like yeah that's um I mean not having children is is not being able to or struggling to have children is a really hard thing to to deal with as a yeah. as a as a couple and um you know, so it's 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 really hard how to, to process that and to enter into that. But um, I think the the thing is that if you see it just purely as for yourself, it's going yeah. to be challenging. But if you can see it, it actually there's a young life that we can see development and growth and given a safe um, home for that young person to be part of. You know, we're we're created to belong, and that's mm -hmm. the the part I. I think, you know, when you get that kind of created, you know, the belong, when you get a loving family that's prepared, that's going to be better for the child than if they don't have that. Yeah. And that's yeah. where adoption comes in. Yeah. I feel like we could go on and talk about this all day. Like it's a, it's a this, this is what I love, what I do, is that we put, you know, I can talk about the bag company and all of that stuff, and I absolutely yeah. love it. But it, it's amazing when you're sitting in, in rooms with, with business uh, business leaders and you know you're keynoting a, a, a leadership meeting and children and care is never mentioned in this thing yeah. and, and then there comes a time where we can talk about some of the issues that actually most of these kids are under 18 they're mm. unseen yeah. they don't wear t-shirts saying I'm a kid in care yeah. you, you know you know yeah. and so for us it's there's something beautiful about the bigger picture yeah. that mad look has created this space to be able to talk about yeah and and sort of getting into mad look then um Obviously, you said at the start there, it stands for Make a Difference Luggage. You started it in 2015. Yeah, yeah. 2014, I got the, <coughs> I watched a video of a young girl and she, it was, a, I was at, we were back in a course, stuck in this little tight room in, in Uri. Um, and, and it was, a, it was in, in Tesco's, you know, Tesco's mm -hmm. give one of their wee boardrooms to, to kind of community groups. And they were trying to show us what we had to do. Week four, they were talking about children and care moving. And they played this video. And it was a young girl, teenager in a wheelchair, and she made this statement, when we move, the trusts or local authorities don't give us suitcases, sometimes foster carers loan us a suitcase, but quite often our belongings are moved in black plastic bin bags and lose their dignity. And I remember that night going, that's wrong, I'm gonna fix it. So that was 2014, and that was a journey then until 2015, when we set up Madlug as a response. It's something you'd never think of. It's such a simple thing as well. Like, Absolutely. And not everybody hears it. Like, my yeah. wife was sitting in the same room. She didn't even hear the bin bag story. Yeah. Yeah. You know, was, I had the reminder of, oh, yeah. So it was it was how everybody's wired. So I, I see it as my black bin bag story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that kind of went, I'm going to fix that. And I think that took me then into, if I'm going to fix that, 
I thought in this initially I'd just go back to the group of young people. We have a little drop-in centre happening then, and you know, after schools clubs, and they all came in with their like school bags. And every year a new school bag. And it was like I'll just collect those, and and they're probably homes where the su- the suitcases that you know they've, they've had last years, and they've went to TK Maxx and got a new one this year. Mm-hmm. And we'll just collect all those old suitcases and give them. But then I started to do research and realised that actually the bin bag story is something that was not just local, but actually was global. Mm-hmm. And that's whenever I started to look at, at how do we then give bags, along with how do we give them new bags rather than secondhand bags. And mm-hmm. was there like no one, when you'd done the research, was there no one really doing anything similar at the time? Was it like a sort of big problem with no real solution? What, what I saw was um, there was there was some charities in America doing stuff around this that were set up, you know, fundraising, yeah. giving bags to kids. And, um, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> an elephant upstairs or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, coming down soon. So, yeah. um, yeah, no, what I, what I noticed, um, at that time was, um, that there was people in America doing the kind of charity fundraising yeah. to give bags. But, um, in the UK, there had been lots of campaigns that was like, mm. you know, ban the bin bag campaign and they got everybody and it was some PR around it and, and we had got good practice and every local authority signed it. And and then, you know, but then nothing was done. So that was like yeah. 10 years ago and we're still sitting and it's being done today. Yeah. And um, and I realized actually in the UK what, what the issue is, is we're really policy driven. So there's a problem. We get a policy in place then job done. Next problem is pushing. We get a policy in place. Yeah. So that led me to like we got to get a solution to this, a practical yeah. solution mm-hmm. to to fix that to fix that problem. The question I have for you is, so you you start at Madlog, you went to this course and you seen the video of the the girl talking about the black bin bags, and at that time you were wanting to um, to use move and you were wanting to get back into fostering. Yeah, so we did. We ended up um, in that year finishing the job. The house went with the job. Yeah. And we ended up um, selling our house in Belfast that we had and then downsizing. So we're now yeah. in a place where actually we have no space to foster. Yeah. But we have significant impact in, in yeah. the lives of foster so, kids. Yeah, the question I have for you on that side of things is you you went to the course with like a direction and a kind of idea that, you know, it was something you're wanting to get back into. But then how was the response from friends family even like your wife <laughs> after you've been to this course and it's pretty clear you're going to this course to think about fostering and and it's kind of like a one you know you're going down one street here it's like you know there's one outcome from this course but you've actually come out and went do you know what no i want to start doing this what was the response like from like friends or family because I, I think for a few weeks i all i did was journal so yeah. I, and research myself so i um you know, I, I'm kind of quite visionary, 20 ideas before I have my breakfast every day type person. Yeah. And so, um, you know, part of the part of that process was I just ended up journal. And, and I've, in my whole life, I have never experienced a moment like it. If I have to be honest, in the f- 2014, where it was just like this download, clarity, vision, excitement. And, and I kept it. And then I remember one night saying to my wife, um, you know, we were sitting What's in TV? I says, do you know that bin bag thing I told you about? I've got a solution. <laughs> <laughs> and and I started, and she says, and I remember saying, oh, that sounds great. Never did she think that I would actually do it. You know, it was like, you know, kind of like us because like she's in the charity space, I'm in the charity space. That's all we ever knew. We'd never done business, but none of us have been in the corporate world. And um, and this is Northern Ireland, so it was this kind yeah. of like, you know, we we have this. Um, but she says, oh, that's, that's a great idea. So she, that, that's all she said. And that's all I said. That's a great idea. And I took that as enough. She's on board. <laughs> <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> so, so then more research, talked them to, started then doing some um, meetings with like organizations that work with care experienced young people. And then did, did the whole kind of like, um, I can't remember if, if you remember the, the kind of ads that were around. There was Infest NI, you know, and they would show somebody that says, I loved horses. Now I've got a business with horses <laughs> yeah. and, and that kind of stuff. And, and yeah. so I was like, I've just got a ring, Infest <laughs> NI. I can get a business Hello, set I up. I need money. <laughs> I, need, I need money and stuff. And I remember at that moment going, okay, I made a phone call. And, I, and, I, and literally my commitment was rather than we're going to do this was I'm going on a process. Yeah. 
and and that's how 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 I kind of took my wife with it, you know, and and in some ways, using the Infest NI, you know. I know now that these things are really easy to get on with, but you see, when you're not from a corporate world, yeah, you just literally, you know, you it literally was like, well, Invest and I have got all the answers for business, so I will just, um, if they allow me on a course, they must think my idea is great. Yeah. So yeah. there was an element of <laughs> element of playing that a little bit, yeah. you know. Yeah. So um, so that then took took me to, uh, um, I remember ringing up Invest and saying, look, I want to start a business. What's your business? And um, told him, he says, well, was it a social enterprise or a business? I had no <laughs> idea what social yeah. enterprise was. Yeah. I literally had never, I'd never even thought of it. I just, so I says, just a business. I want to make money. And with the profits, I want to get bags for kids. And um, then I, that was the trigger point that I did a huge amount of research on what a social enterprise was, social enterprise, and realized actually that was the platform. And I went back and then joined the program for social enterprises. I now love social enterprise and kind of um, on the board of social enterprise and I and love, but you know, in the in the eight years. But for, I had no idea what it was back then. For anyone like listening who doesn't know what a social enterprise is, do you want to just give them like a quick sort of definition of what it is and what's it about? <laughs> well, everybody that runs a social enterprise will have a different answer to this. So <laughs> <laughs> that's part of the problem. Um, for me, social enterprise is simply you, where you do business and it's, um, and it's all about profit, but it's what you do with the profit. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's no different than any other business. It's just it's driven for social purpose and the profit is used for the benefit of social purpose. Because I think people hear, people hear the word business and they they see you know you're obviously you're coming on the podcast and it's you're the founder of Madlog and there is that perception where people will be thinking here maybe listening to this in the car or whatever and they're going oh he must have a nice house and a fancy car and all this here but <laughs> actually like when you look into it Madlog you have it set up as um is it a CIC yeah so what what exactly yeah so you know the most of the, most of the, the kind of models of the Madlog came out of or the mod, the idea of Madlog and the the model we use came out of the kind of Tom Shoes model was mm-hmm. heavily influenced by that. Um, you know mm-hmm. the sh- the shoe company that buy a pair of shoes yeah. give a pair. Oh, right. um, in America and um, <clears throat> and so you know in America wealth and philanthropy is really celebrated together, but I knew straight away in Northern Ireland is it that you know we're really great as a country here at celebrating the underdog. Mm-hmm. And we're desperate at celebrating the success, mm. and and I knew that that I needed to do something that that Dave wasn't going to become rich on the back of a social mission, yeah. and and so community and trust company a CIC is a locked asset. So actually, I don't own it. Um, I have a, a foundry board of directors who choose what I get paid. I get paid just to do the role as being CEO for it. And um, they 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 make all the choices around that, and um, and actually I have nothing I can ever sell. And then alongside that CIC, we then have set up a registered charity that every time we sell a bag, the money for that bag each month goes to the charity, and the charity is then responsible for the delivery of the bags to the kids in care. Reason being, business first for us. Business generates the ability to give, and if I have a board of directors. In my CIC, that um, and I, I'm doing both things, like giving to the kids in care. Is the the reality is that we'll end up spending hours in meetings talking about where the bags are going, and the business then fails, or we end up talking about the business succeeding. So we've separated those two things out just to give us focus. And the, the production aspect, where did you start there with that? Like, how did who started developing the bags and stuff? And- yeah, so I'll go back a stage. So there was like, I had 500 pounds. I remember sending to my wife mm-hmm. and saying, look, I'm going to start this. And she says, well, that's great, but we have no money. And as a youth worker, you don't have, uh, you know, you have enough just to pay your bills. Um, so I said, look, just be patient and allow me to have sa- a salary from five different avenues. So if I, what do we need? So we set a figure each month that we needed to pay for the cover of our bills. And I said, look, I'll get that. Whether it's a, a few hours in Tesco's, a that's few a brave thing to say to you. Like, either. just be patient. If I said that, there'd be more. <laughs> just be patient. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, she was, she was very, she's been very patient and very supportive. And um, but it was, it was more asking just the sense of, okay, we're not going to put risk off the, 
and at 500 pounds, so it was the 480 pounds was the 40% deposit for the brand in company. So we went to this company, it's no longer around called Studio Stereo, and they basically designed our brand. And we, we, um, they wanted 40% up front. Right. And so that was 480 pounds of the 500 pounds. My fir- other 20 pounds was the first month subscription to Shopify <laughs> to get my store. And I had never done anything like this before. I knew exa- I knew kind of what I wanted, but I, because I had no money, being dyslexic, one of the things is there's a problem. How do I find a solution? So I walked around every shop, TK Maxx, all of the JD Sports, and started to realize, and Debenhams was around at that time, that all of the the kind of brands all had the classic backpack, which was the pocket in front of the the, the bag. Right. And I thought, rather than get innovative, I have no money to be innovative. We could we can create a classic a bag company and really be bold with our brand. And that was kind of the, the reason we have the big bold brand and plain colored bags. That mm-hmm. was where it started. But it was because we had no money. And then I <laughs> and then I went live. And in those days Facebook Live you didn't need any money. You could literally just stand in front of a camera and get traction. Mm. You know, it's it's very different now. Mm. I don't think I could do it now, yeah. to be honest. But it was able to just stand and go, right, guys, here's, we've got three samples, you know, we just said, here, we're selling these bags tomorrow, um, but I'm asking you to be patient. You know, it might take three to four weeks. And we got enough orders the first, the first day to be able to put our first order in. Now, since then, I've realized that's illegal. Yeah. So if you're a police and you're listening to me, please don't come after <laughs> me. It was it was simply just I hadn't a clue. As a youth worker, that's what I give the excuse it's, for. There, there was no bags. There was no they bags. Them and there was no, <laughs> bags. There was no, there was no <laughs> bags, and we said just be patient. So we oh. had the order. So yeah. like bags. We had, we drop ship them. We on the post. Drop <laughs> ship them. Yeah. Yeah. It was custom made. Yeah, yeah. So so it was probably um, so at that particular time we just were fortunate. I I couldn't even risk, if I'm being mm. honest, the whole um, crowdfunding approach. You know, let's crowdfund yeah. before yeah. because, like. In my forties, no business background. This is Northern Ireland. My mates, my business friends were saying this is great, but it's not North America. The only two brands at that particular time that had been created here in Northern Ireland mm. that that we were exporting out was O'Neill's sports clothes yeah. and a Mac in a sack, the little raincoats, oh, and yeah. and they're you know they're still around and they're a great company. Yeah. Uh, but they were the only two things that kind of were doing this um, this model. And, and I, um, you know, for, for me, it was a matter of like, nobody would believe me and I couldn't take the risk of failure. Yeah. So, uh, so I was saying, please be patient, please be patient. Unfortunately, we got enough to, to order the basic minimum. Yeah. And, yeah sort of just and in terms of like you personally, like it's such a selfish thing to do. Like you're saying there, like all the profits go on to like the cause basically. Like was there not points where like you yourself were like struggling and thinking, I don't know if I'm gonna do, be able to do this type of thing. Like, was there points I got? I mean, a couple, of, a couple of. Th- there was times. I think the biggest challenge I had in 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 this whole journey was the whole loneliness of entrepreneurship. Yeah. Do you know when you, you're just like two years into it, and at that stage you still don't have team, and you're you're just you know, am I going to see this take off the next level? You know, we definitely weren't a quick. Um, a quick win business, you know, right up to about 2018. It was it was times where I think I was only it took me three years before I was fully paid. So yeah. it was like you know I was using the the route, but I was fortunate to have been given consultancy type work that paid me well for half a day's work that didn't have to go to Tesco. Uh, kind of keep you afloat. Kept me afloat yeah. with good money to be able to keep my, my bills paid, and um, and that was kind of kind of the route. But what I've learned in this whole journey is. Money always follows vision, mm. and I and I was you know I think there's a myth where it's like let's go out and raise all the money. I think if I'd have had that, I would have made so many mistakes. It probably would have had a business. It's not here today, but the the idea of just continuing to grow the vision, being authentic, being you know driving all that stuff, people see that, and then the money follows, mm-hmm. and and mm-hmm. that's been our kind of kind of kind of growth story. In, in terms of obviously you were saying they're starting the business and you know growing it and, and friends were saying this isn't America like I suppose from your end starting that like and having that kind of s- probably not outward you know people didn't believe in you but, but kind of that subtle like he doesn't think I'm gonna be able to do this here what what was that like in terms of 
th- I think that you know at the time I'm just one of those kind of I'll prove you kind yeah. of they're just stubborn as I think most entrepreneurs you talk to have got that I think the learning that in it that um, you know you can you can see it as negative the real learning for me is that actually all of those friends were saying it not because they didn't believe but it's because they cared you yeah. know they they don't want that they were protecting me from failure they were protecting me from yeah. you know building my hopes up in something to then it not work yeah um, and that was the you know so now when I see that I find the right people to have around me um, but in those earlier days you know you're talking but so I tend to not use my family for this kind of stuff and yeah. the reason being is because they care yeah and um, they want to protect yeah so to say is there's like a saying like if you want to know who your real friends are start a business or something isn't it <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. absolutely but that's the interesting way to look at it because a lot of people would have seen those people saying to you oh you're gonna do or don't do it and being like oh you're doubting me that wouldn't have thought oh we're worried about you or don't want you to lose all your money sort of thing like. yeah no absolutely absolutely the the i mean i think part of the thing Suppose the thing starting a business at forty two is you don't actually realise mm. how much the years mm. before. So I, you know, I thought I'm in business. What did I learn in youth work? Actually, everything I learned in youth work that makes me a better business leader. It taught me how to, to work with less because I, w- I didn't have budgets for everything. It taught me how to be creative. It taught me how to communicate. To uh, you know, young people are hard to motivate and to to communicate to. I learned that. Mm. It gave me a, a focus on clarity, um, and all of those bits. And it and it also, I think, in that place, in fact, I was just listening to a, an audio book this morning. And I was doing some grass cutting and things, and um, one of one of the things that that came out was, are we continual learners? And and I'm like, I I would never have said I was intentional with this, but actually, my whole life. And partly the dyslexia is, I've I, I've got this curiosity. So if something triggers it, I want to learn how to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I think that's the stuff. If we can create cultures of life like that, and then we're secure on, you know, I, I, you know, I, when you're secure in, in who you are and what you bring to the table, yeah. Then actually those things become less about me. They become actually you can start to see the perspective of what your family are saying. They yeah. care. Yeah. I like think like it's another thing. Like if like that's I can't speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, well, I, I normally just, have. I normally have. That's that. what you were saying there. It's just like I was thinking. Like you know, you started this business when you're in your mid thirties. No, early forties. Early forties, even. Mm-hmm. So like, there's a lot of people like sort of our age or maybe like you know stressing out, like they don't know what they want to do. They're like, you know, freaking out and putting pressure on themselves about trying to figure things out in their twenties and coming out of uni like what would you say to someone who's maybe sitting there thinking like i don't know what i'm doing here you know you started your business i i would say the thing is is you know see life as learning and so yeah. you you know it you don't have to have it all worked out and you know i went from training to be an architectural technician to a youth worker and in that journey i grew as in in who i was to this place of of running business and and get the opportunity now to you know i get the opportunity to to be at universities and talking yeah. about business stuff and all as somebody who's only relatively new to this is it's just about every day is a learning day mm. um if you're if you've got an idea um i think just go for it try it doesn't do any harm you know and don't see don't see what you start today particularly as a young person as the thing that you're going to finish that life in even in the same space you know basically yeah. start it so there's this thing yet yeah, i'm possibly and it's, it's i'm not ruling myself into this category but i'm possibly in the, my last thing that i really build up to do well which is my which is mad lug yeah but if i started mad lug when i was in my early 20s mm-hmm. i probably would have ha- i would have more of an a, an exit strategy and, a, and the learning and who i was and growing as a as a person yeah. there'd be things that i would be meeting people i'd be meeting things i'd do that i would probably go okay try something new and exit that so yeah. i think that's okay give yourself that <coughs> that permission yeah mm-hmm. um but the other part is f- if you've got something find your black bin bag story in it so mm. my story is not the care system my story is find your black bag in it and yeah. we really are narrow because i found my black bin bag story so it's the story within the story yeah 
that matters. And so whether that be a profit making kind of just standard business, USP, or whether that be a social, what is the thing that breaks yeah. your heart, gives you a lot of joy or, or is your specialty? Because that allows you really to keep on track. Yeah, so like when you're going through like a difficult time or like maybe thinking like this isn't going to work, like you'd always think back to that story and like why you're doing it basically. Yeah, and <coughs> and whenever like competitors and things happen, it then just focuses you on. So, you know, we're, we're in a place where there's lots, uh, John Lewis put out a brilliant data about children <coughs> in care. It's a, you know, we, we call it, we see things being, um, you know, culturally more, people are aware of so yeah. so like years ago it was like trafficking there was a great awareness that was the talk of everyone then there's homelessness um i think children in care space is is actually you know becoming more talked about more so what we're seeing actually in the uk is lots of charity setting up doing the the giving of bags to kids yeah and in some ways <coughs> our com com you know competitors but they're also friends because we're doing yeah. the same mission together but that what that's done is it's allowed me to go okay what is our story within it? And actually, as a team, we've become more and more fine-tuned, focused on what we're doing. So the bags we give the kids are a little pack-away travel bag. At times, we have been tempted to go, do we give them a backpack filled with pajamas and toothbrushes? And that would be a nice thing and helpful. Mm. But actually, when all this stuff's happening in the UK in a charity space, we're going, though, we give little fold-away bags because they're small, they're compact, they get into yeah. social workers' cars. And they, they fit our mission, which is no child should carry life in a bin bag. It's interesting, like you said <laughs> there about like there's different like bag charities sort of starting up, and like they're not you wouldn't see them as competitors. Like it's like if it was any other type of business, it might be like oh god, you know, here's another one coming along where you're actually like these are all working towards the same sort of problem. Yeah, there's days where you do see them as competitors. You <laughs> know? It's, yeah. I mean, the key to business is all about and mission and movement. I mean, the charity sector is the most competitive space in the world because we're all, com the, you know, charity space is all about competing against mm -hmm. funds. And um, and obviously everybody wants theirs to be the thing, you know. Yeah. Um, Apple want the phone to be the iPhone. They don't want it to be the Google, you know. So they're, yeah. they're, 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 they're there's a competitor that wants your thing in bigger, but yeah. not everybody. It's unrealistic to say everybody's going to use an iPhone. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so there is, but I, I, you know, I just think for me, it's about, it, you know, it's the answer to whenever you're feeling a com them being a competitor, it's like they can be a friend because yeah. actually we know what our black bin bag story is within yeah. that story. And yeah. in terms of obviously, you know, you can see, success is like a big sort of big paycheck if that makes sense but in terms of for you guys how many bags has it you've been able to provide to so we have just just literally yesterday the the latest figure is we have just given over seventy thousand bags <laughs> God. and um so if you and we take that monetary value of the bag so um off of 10 pounds per bag so the time yeah. it's posted if you if a local authority was to go and um, have to buy a bag they'll probably have to spend 10 pounds so we if you work that out that's a seven hundred thousand pounds of monetary value generated through our business and we to date have not had any investors involved so it's been from that 500 pounds the, there's no product selling the product given the bags from the product the additional profit in, the, in that has been reinvested in to grow it and there's a small team keeping it really lean <coughs> and then um, seven seven hundred thousand pounds. Gosh, Never awesome. mind the impact, the, the mental impact that it has on and benefits it has on the well-being of the child receiving and not having a bin bag, which we haven't really even got into calculating that. That's, that's crazy. So funny. When you like, do you think back now mm. to like when you were sitting in that room to think what how many years, f five, six, seven years later you'd be raised like what seven hundred thousand in sales basically. Mm. I probably didn't think I would get to that that level, you know. Um, um, uh, you know, I, I really didn't. Um, we have a tar We're on target to give by April twenty twenty four, a um, hundred thousand. That's our our aim, and um, we that will be us hitting a million pounds off of <laughs> of monetary value, um, and we're we we're quite confident that we will we will get to that. Yeah. It's only been enabled though because we have customers who have chosen to buy a Madlug bag over. Another, another brand yeah. and that for me has been you know that's the 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 model of what we what we have done and and we've had some amazing times where i remember in 2018 we had um part-time working mom who was a an influencer for about 75 
thousand people and she's got hundreds of thousands now but on instead she puts on um we didn't even send her the bags we just met her she had care experienced and um experienced a bin bag herself and um she literally shared our story and within 10 hours we stole out of all our stock oh we God. put in again we sold out again within a few days and it was just this kind of like in fact some some ways i look back and think we had our own sweatshop you know because there was so many people volunteering and helping <laughs> yeah. family members you know it was <laughs> yeah. like this was just going crazy and we were in the third we were third floor of a little shop unit in Lurgan. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like, yeah. it was just pure madness. So we had that. Then in 2020, we had IKEA come to us and go, we want to give all our staff in the UK and Ireland a Mad Lug bag for Christmas. So that that then was another 13,000 bags. Oh, the, year, the year later, then we had Shopify come and say, we, um, we want to give every person at our conference um, so that was Canada and New Zealand and the Republic of Ireland. So with 3,000 bags went to that. And then last year we, we sold 5,000 bags to John Lewis as a wholesaler. Yeah. So they are now selling online. And this year we hope to be in store with John Lewis. That's lethal. No, it's mad, wow. John Lewis. Yeah. I'd actually seen the advert that you were talking about. The one that is the da- the, the, the adoptive. Skateboard. Yeah, yeah, the guy on the skateboard. And then, yeah. Your bag was in it, was it? No, so um, our bag, um, we, our bags, we were part of the, the process of the story. Story. Um, but our bag was, so the, the video, the, the TV ad, was yeah. sent out as a preview to the My John Lewis members. Yeah. And um, we, we went out on the same email to 5.1 million <laughs> email subscribers on that. So there was the John Lewis TV ad and then another and then mad lug wow and then for two days we had um we were exclusive to the members and then we went live to the to them everybody yeah. <coughs> but what was really amazing in the two days was john lewis then started putting out in twitter and um particularly twitter this happened and um basically the tv ad and the, the whole kind of care experience world and people who who were all kind of like wow this is brilliant we love we feel really encouraged wow well done john lewis and it started people just started going so john lewis when are you, um when are you going to sell mad lug bags <laughs> because nobody could see that they were because we were exclusive product for two days yeah. so for that two days people are tagging john lewis and saying you've got to stock you know why don't you stock mad lug bags and then somebody found out and says i've just realized they are another win so that yeah, was the, the kind yeah. of so it was the kind of sense of brand authority we were we were gathering there in the in that, that kind of space would that have been like one of the biggest sort of like pinch yourself almost and you're like, well, like look what we're doing here type of thing like in terms of achievements or yeah that's that's um it's been a real it's it's really amazing moment however as a leader mm. i have to i'm now having to teach myself that to celebrate wins because what I've realized is as a visionary, I have yeah. a big picture of a painting of where it's going. And sometimes I don't celebrate. So I now have the guys on our team saying, like, if, if I don't celebrate this or we don't think of let's go out to the, you know, let's go out for some food or let's do something to, to acknowledge this, you know, like, you initiate, tell me, because sometimes I'll miss it or I'm being really intentional learning. It's just, it's that, it's that vision of, you know, the painting hasn't been completed yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you just keep going. So, um, but it was definitely looking back. It was definitely, um, and in and in terms of the sort of, in terms of obviously you have like the John Lewis stuff. You have IKEA. You know all these big moments in kind of the business. But for you, obviously, the big focus has been, you know, creating value in these kids' lives. So, like, have you got any? Has anybody reached out to you? who has been sort of like affected by what what you do positively or yeah we we get we get um feedback our biggest supporters um and and champions are care <coughs> care experienced young people yeah mm-hmm. um and care leavers and um that gives us a huge l- uh, amount of authority but if i think back there's a couple of a couple of quick stories um and experiences that i've had with this is one 2018 um, we had started going to like this little um, youth festival thing that happens locally, 1,500 young people. And um, in the early days, we started just selling at it alongside Outside In. And um, 
we we were kind of like you know as we've been selling so it was like a few years before so 2018 we were getting there 300 young people out of the 1500 we noticed had mad look bags so it was pretty like you know he started to, to realize that actually this is cool like every group of young people that were there you know they were carrying their fans and carrying their the kankins and then they had mad look so a youth worker came along to the stand and said um yeah we have a young guy who's in care we would love to um you know with us and that was all he was the youth worker was buying a bag for his wife and i thought well do you know what there's no risk of stigma here um there's 300 young people so told the youth worker go back to the young person and tell them to come down to our stand choose a color of backpack that they would like as a gift and we'll give it to them but he doesn't they don't have to you know even introduce themselves just look at the colors go back to you you can come down and get it mm. so there's no awkwardness because i'm really passionate in social enterprise or in social movements is that often we get into the it, it feeds our egos and makes us feel and i'm like i don't i don't need the feel good feeling of meeting a young person and getting the photograph and all of this sort of stuff this is this is just about the impact that i was interested in and so um that was how i left it the last day, the young person, um, youth worker and the young person arrived down. Youth worker says, hi Dave, this is Jay. I went and said, Jay, what color bag would you like? He says, I'm colorblind. I said, what football yeah, team? Let's go. <laughs> which, which football team do you support? So he took a red bag, so I'll let you work out what team that was. <laughs> and um, and he's standing there with a red bag. And, and I says, Jay, tell me your story. Because the thing I've learned in this journey is it's not our story to tell, it's their story to own. And um, I says, what's your story? He says, I'm 17 and a half. And he says, I've been in care for 10 years. And in a, in a two week period in that 10 years, I moved 15 times with my belongings in bin bags. Wow. Um, and what do you do is amazing. What do you do is amazing. What do you do is amazing. So I looked outside the, the marquee where we were selling from and there was you know, just lots of young people. The tears started coming down my eyes. I'm thinking, you know, I was nearly embarrassed to turn around, you know, because I was like, I didn't want to put any emotion and, mm -hmm. you know, pressure on the, the, the guy, mm -hmm. like 17 and a half year old guy. And, um, and I turned around and apologized because there was tears. And I says, like, what's really amazing is there's over 300 young people at this event who have chosen to buy Mad Lug bags over any other brands. Why? Because every one of them believes that you are incredible. You have huge value, huge worth, serves to be treated with dignity. The guy smiled. Off he goes with his red bag, comes back later that night. There's this little girl, and all I remember was I've never seen a young person with a, f a smile like it. She had frizzy hair, half his height, and she just smiled. And Jay came and says, I had to just come back and say thank you. And he flung his arms around me with this huge hug. And, and, and that was like, wow. But that isn't even the end of the story. Like the two days into being back, get this message on facebook messenger saying hi i'm jay i met dave linton at at um, this event and um i've been given it huge amounts of thought um i love what you do and i've decided that for my 18th birthday all the money that i get is going to go to the work of mad Luck so that other young people can experience what i have experienced and something changed for me because i set this simply up how do i get a bag company to sell a bag so I can practically and physically give it back. And something changed that day, it said, our bag company is not just about giving bags. It's about communicating of the value, worth, and dignity of the incredible children and young people in care. And many of them feel lost and unseen, out of touch. They don't carry the jumpers with I'm in care. They're in child protection cases. So, the, so for for us, we've created this brand without really intentionally doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is actually going... Um, you know, it's it's kind of like love without words, or you know, um, when when it's carried, people in community are saying, "We see you, we know you, we believe in you, we love you." And for me, that is the the thing that has happened, and um, and we're seeing that more and more. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. That's unreal. Another story. I'll tell you another story of that. Um, same same experience. If you if time, um, we were in England, the south of England, last year. Mm -hmm. And the, we were packing down our stand. It was at a, it was forty thousand people at this festival. We were packing down our stand, 
and comes five people and, and there was three young people and two adults and I'm not sure whether youth workers were foster carers or whether they were um, you know social workers I have no idea what the relationship was but there was a, a, a the, the the adult female um, in the in the group says I believe you give bags to kids in care these kids are in care and you could just imagine put yourself into even not being in care and just a young person being introduced to these adults so it was like oh they felt awkward there was this awkwardness going on <laughs> yeah. and I, I just says guys you ever heard of Madlog this is this is what we do we believe we're the only bad company that believe that you're incredible you know we're we're all about and um, it says we'd love to give you a bag and half of them were in boxes by a stage and what colours you like and we'd give them their bags and I says you know every time you see somebody wearing this they believe in you mm-hmm. and um, believe you're incredible You've made our you've made our trip worthwhile to the south of England. It's been brilliant. Mm. This the youngest girl was must have been about eleven, twelve. She puts her hand in her pocket. She pulls out of her pocket like this, and I I knew she'd put and I think she's gonna give me money, and um, so I was like, no, no, we're, it's, these are free. These are free. Don't, you keep it yourself because like for me it's about give, give, give. That's mm. my yeah. motive, you know. And the adult female says um, she really wants you to have it. So I took the took the stuff. She put her hand. I closed it. I says, "Guys, have a good day. Thank you. These are fab, all that stuff." And they went away. Opened my hand, and there was eighty three p. And and so the impact even on this bag company we have created, and the impact on the young person was that she actually took her hand. She took every penny, yeah. and actually gave it to the work of Madlog. Yeah. Because of the impact of just receiving the bag. Yeah. And and so there's been moments and moments like that where we we have just had huge you know those times where I have been lonely yeah and you've got a letter or an email and it's like you know it's just went okay this is why I'm here this is what yeah. I'm doing mm-hmm. that's amazing mm-hmm. purpose purpose absolutely I think on that we'll we'll wrap it up I would love to know in terms of you you'd allude it there hundred thousand you'd buy twenty twenty four but like. So uh, what what is next in terms of even for yourself? Like obviously you're, you you said earlier on, this is probably the last thing you'll do before you kind of retire as such. But like I'll probably never retire. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's, yeah. not my, it's not my style. And yeah. because I've done this, I've no pension. So yeah, <laughs> it's kind of like you know, the reality is that I'm gonna have to do something. You yeah. Know? What is sort of like next up? What what is the either whether it be business or charity wise? You know what is kind of. I think I think for me we have a plan in ten years to be in um, two international markets and and then the UK. We want to hit the three hundred thousand bags given, mm-hmm. and um, and and we're we're setting the business up now to do it. We've never had investment to date. Um, we're putting some um, really strategic things in place, um, which will and may change what I do in the in the in the business or in the movement. Um, you know, we've, we're rebuilding our um, voluntary board, and we have a new chairperson who's just literally been appointed, and and we're moving a lot of that actually into London. So people who have got connections, people who know next level thinkers mm-hmm. around business. So we're really mm-hmm. scaling the position in the business, so that then for that scale we can then do the investment that if that's needed, um, scale team. We're looking at a number of things. So with all that, you know, like I'm a visionary. And so I don't see myself not doing the mad log thing. But at some point, the business operational thing will become something outside of what mm. is my my skill set and also what I bring best to the table. So yeah. that's really what it looks like. And with that, I have no idea what mm. that looks like. You seem well connected in the business world as well. Like you seem like, you know, a lot of people who sort of sort of give if they give you some direction or well it, i mean it comes from what we've talked about in the in the podcast is it it's position yourself as a learner yeah mm-hmm. and and one of the things one of the things i hear often from young people um setting up young guys is this sense of how they set governance up but they want to keep control yeah so it's like you know i'm not gonna like what i've done in a cic is m- scary for for a 20 something that's never done business setting up their own because they think I'm like I need control yeah. you know and I'm like the first employee that you hire you lose control yeah. and actually by me setting the business up I've been able to attract people like I have 
you know, top a top lawyer on my board, mm-hmm. commercial lawyer, who f- gives his time for free, mm-hmm. and 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 mentors me along in the journey of that stuff, which I couldn't have got if I was a set up as a profit making mm-hmm. business, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and so that's how I've stayed connected is you know being clear on what I'm about, um, being relational. And actually a collaborator. You know, the other part I, I think is there's too much of this using people in business and, and actually people see through it. So you'll get you'll get what you need from somebody the first time, maybe the second time, but at some point you'll get a bad reputation. And anybody that works with me is I give more than I take. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's that's how we, I've stayed connected and have connections with some of the some really key influential business guys around the UK because of that. Mm-hmm. Is that I'm not out about filling Dave or creating Dave's next step or yeah. just making Mad Lug work or getting mm. all the resource for us. Um, did you meet? Was it Richard Branson? Did you have lunch with him or something? Or? Yeah, yeah, I had um, a brunch with Richard Branson. It was one of six um, um, six entrepreneurs that um, was invited to lunch. I got a, an invite on a Thursday afternoon. It was for the or Friday afternoon. An email to be in London for the next Thursday. And um, there was myself and a, another Northern Irish entrepreneur there, and um, and and that was just an amazing, amazing experience. I'll tell you quickly how that happens because this there's a lot of learning in this too. I was part of like the Ulster Bank Accelerator program at the time, <laughs> yeah, bit of community, and um, they they taught you how to pitch. So when how we started, he says that's the best. It was because I learned a lot of that in the Ulster Bank Accelerator, how to pitch, how to get in thirty seconds, and so forth. Um, but they had a pitching competition. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Should I ask you a more complicated question? Yeah. <laughs> so they had they had a, a pitching competition and um, it was like, you know, win £5,000 and get brunch with Richard Branson. And I, I applied for it and didn't get through. Nice. And, and it was in the, the, this big virgin bus kind of at the at the um, digital DNA conference. Yeah. I didn't even have a ticket for that. I didn't even know what that was at the time. I know what it is now. And, and I thought, well, do you know what? I'm going to take myself to Belfast. I'm going to work from a coffee shop and I'm going to go and see who got through and see what I can learn. So it was definitely a positional learner. So I mm. went down um, to watch them to see what I, what I yeah. you know, what they chose. And they're this bus and it was like five, ten minute little kind of like talks about certain things. Mm-hmm. And um, so I thought, I'll just stand and listen to the Virgin bus. First one up was crowdfunding. And I'm like, I'm not doing crowdfunding, never doing crowdfunding. And there was this um, this lady talking about, you know, how you do crowdfunding. And if you're interested, you know, come and meet me. So yeah. I went for, got my name down, says just, just two or three people in front of you. What's your business? By the end of the time I told my business, I ended up getting meeting the Virgin PR person, the strategy person. I got I just ended up spending a whole afternoon on this bus talking to people. Went on holidays, my first holiday with my wife and family that was like, Do you know what? I have cover in place and I'm not working. Are you switching off? I'm switching off. Yeah. I was sitting in France in a caravan and um my wife went to do the laundry at midweek. Mm-hmm. And I lifted my iPad out and I was like, um, chance to get back in the game um, and, and have brunch with Richard Branson. <laughs> so, so I'm like... Holiday cancelled. <laughs> no, so it was like, right. So my wife was away at this stage and, um, and I had to do a 60 second pitch mm. to camera. So I'm sitting, clear skies, feeling like Richard Branson is <laughs> So there with a, the iPad going, 90,000 kids in care, one child moved there, 15 minutes, blah, blah. And then it was like, um, and sent it off. And then checked them emails a couple of days later saying, um, you've been successful to, to, um, to, you know, in your, in your application. I hadn't read what the application was. I just heard <laughs> Richard Branson make this pitch. It ended up that they were on my case the second week. <laughs> Of this all day, I was not supposed to work, and um, and saying you have t- on Monday or I, I was getting back that week. I had about three or four days. I had to launch a crowdfunding campaign. Oh, wow. <laughs> I hadn't even thought of. So it was like, um, and the person who got brunch and won a thousand pounds was the person who had raised the most in the first seventy-two hours of the four-week campaign. Right. Okay. So again, Facebook Live. Mm. Hi guys. I need ten thousand. <laughs> I need ten thousand pounds starting Friday to Monday. Who's on board? Come on. 
And we were miles ahead, miles ahead, six thousand pounds ahead of any other competition. Um, by the Monday, ten minutes before we came third, because what I didn't realize was by naivety was um, I was just going for it, and 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 we were like miles and miles ahead. They the other competitors they had a few because they were already planning the strategy. They had a few big donors oh, yeah. by the sidelines to make sure they won. Yeah. Uh-huh. So like first, you know, five minutes was like, we're winning, we're winning. And I was like, oh crap, we came, we came, <laughs> we came third. Um, and that was it, thought it was over. And then suddenly, because the crowdfunding organization really loved our attitude, our approach, our learning, they said actually, the others didn't actually raise. The one who won got an extra thousand. So they finished at 9,000. Um, the ones who came second didn't get their f- overall target, so didn't even, you know, get any money. Mm-hmm. And you guys went on from seven or eight thousand pounds at the, the seventy-two hours to twenty-four thousand pounds. So actually, you guys are the winners. <laughs> so we raised twenty-four thousand pounds and then got invited to have brunch with Richard Branson. So the <laughs> idea is, is see everything as an opportunity for learning. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's pretty. That's cool, isn't it? And what was it like, what sort was of, like? having in that uh, in that room, like in terms of meeting him? Like, was there much? I I have to be honest. You see that up until that space, up until that, like from the invite, I'm around the high school, meet Richard Branson. Oh, it's brilliant because I I'm not a big reader, um, but those are books I did read. Yeah. Very mm. slowly, and um, <laughs> and loved his whole approach of stuff. I'm going to read. And my wife is the you know has so brilliant for keeping things level and taking yeah. the nerves out. Things says Dave just an ordinary person yeah and then i whenever i went you know it's like you know i'm I'm kind of a hoodie sweatshirt kind of guy and whenever yeah. somebody says Boy. it's either you know it's it's business wear it's easy to wear a suit but actually when it's like smart casual and you don't mm. do smart <laughs> casual you're like kind of going, oh, flip what they do so i was <laughs> yeah. like i would get a jacket for chinos all that kind of stuff but the but the reality was um when i met him i arrived in that morning and the senior director of Virgin for marketing was mm-hmm. this guy, Steve, at the time. And he came over and he says, Dave, how are you doing? He says, I love what you do. And he says, I have never, ever told anybody in the corporate world this, but I for- spent the first six years of my life in care. Wow. And there, was a, there was like a moment of this corporate world. And actually, we freed somebody today. Yeah. from this kind of like their their story has been unleashed we've given them opportunity to share in a business context and and it just made the whole event really normal yeah. and then you met somebody who's your hero but actually they tell you never to meet your heroes yeah but whenever i met richard branson he was a real deal yeah so yeah. down to earth just a genuine guy. i thought you were gonna say something <laughs> 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 oh no <laughs> oh, that's amazing um thanks so much for coming on it's like, been it's been great what yeah, you are doing is incredible. Like, and I survived it. I was nervous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be more nervous for us. Once for I asked, <laughs> once I asked about the thirty-second thing, you were like snowballer, yeah. playing sail for me. <laughs> hurdle, <laughs> first hurdle over and done with. <laughs> you know, it's listen. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's all we're saying, and um, obviously we'll link all of your um, social media websites and absolutely. all, and obviously um, just get clicking on that and 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 learn more um but yes dave honestly it's been a pleasure thank you very much thank you awesome thank you